Okay, thank you, Janet, for inviting me to come and speak. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at the library with uh, all of you. So um, today I'm going to talk about nutrition and how to maximize the nutrition of your fruits and vegetables. And you might think it's very straightforward, just eat more fruits and vegetables. But as we'll see, it's not that simple. And in fact, um, there's a whole science to maximizing the nutrition out of your, your diet and your fruits and vegetables. So when we talk about nutrition, there's two kinds of nutrients. There's macronutrients, which are your protein, carbohydrate, and fat. And then there's your micronutrients, which are in two, ca two categories, either vitamins and minerals or phytochemicals or plant-based compounds and chemicals. So in the United States, we have um, an abundance of calories, an abundance of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. So most people are not lacking in macronutrients. However, studies show that the majority of Americans have a significant deficiency in both uh, vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. Um, and that's very important in terms of your long-term health and preventing disease. So statistically, there's multiple vitamin and mineral deficiencies and uh, phytochemical deficiencies very widespread in the population. So my approach to health in a nutshell is what I call the Paleo-Vedic uh, diet. And what that entails is a nutrient-dense uh, Paleo diet. And nutrient-dense helps you maximize those vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals that I will be talking about. And then it also involves um, a diet that's customized for your Ayurvedic body type. So in Ayurveda, which is the traditional medicine from India, it's believed that each of us has a unique body type or constitution, and there is an optimal diet that uh, pairs the best with that constitution. I also strongly emphasize spices, which we'll talk about uh, for many reasons, because they're a great source of antioxidants and uh, anti-inflammatory compounds. I recommend uh, regular daily detoxification using foods and uh, periodic, more intensive detoxification. Um, I won't be talking much about um, the other topics in this slide. Today, we're going to talk about nutrients and nutrition. I just want to mention one thing about uh, daily detoxification using foods. And uh, this is one of my favorite foods for regular uh, detoxification, and that, uh, that is beet greens. So basically, um, everybody here has had uh, beet, beets, the beet root, but actually um, the greens, the leafy top of the beets, are uh, richer in antioxidants than the roots themselves, and also a rich source of uh, multiple compounds that support healthy liver function. Um, so if you get beets, uh, try to get them with the leaves, and don't throw those away. They're actually the most nutritious part, and uh, something I recommend consuming regularly to uh, detoxify. So we're going to talk now about vitamins and minerals. And there is a significant difference between vitamins in whole foods and in supplements. So when you look at vitamins and minerals within foods, they actually are very complex structures that have uh, many different cofactors and enzymes and elements. And they're uh, working together synergistically to really um, give your body optimal nutrition. So they're, um, if you have... Um, vitamin donuts where donuts are fortified with vitamins that's very different from vitamins uh, in whole foods. So often when you read uh, labels, you'll see that a product is uh, enriched or fortified with, um, with vitamins. And typically, you know, those are synthetic vitamins which are not the same as the vitamins in foods. So let's take an example. So vitamin E. This is an essential vitamin. We all need vitamin E. It's a fat-soluble vitamin and an antioxidant. Um, here's an example of what you might get as a supplement if you went to a health food store or Whole Foods. So typically, vitamin E, um, in this particular supplement, it's listed as D-alpha tocopherol, which according to the FDA can be labeled vitamin E. So this um, tocopherol is usually um, derived from a petroleum source. When you look at the whole food source of vitamin E, it actually has uh, four different tocopherols, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and four tocotrienols, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, as well as uh, xanthine and other factors. 
So basically, the whole vitamin E complex is very different from what you might get as, as a vitamin E supplement, where you would get only um, alpha tocopherol, basically less than one-eighth of the entire uh, vitamin E complex. So f good food sources of uh, vitamin E are um, olive, uh, olive oil is an excellent source, nuts and seeds, like almonds and sunflower seeds, um, greens are a particularly good source, like uh, spinach and mustard greens, as are um, avocados. And going into spices, um, you may not realize, but spices are often very good sources of vitamins and minerals, uh, in addition to um, antioxidants. So um, chili powder and paprika actually has a fair amount of uh, vitamin E as well. So why does this matter? Uh, surely if you're taking extra vitamins or supplements, that's not gonna cause any harm. It's just gonna you know, go out of your body uh, harmlessly, but that's actually not the case. So um, supplements can potentially cause harm. So uh, one study, we talked about um, vitamin E. So a study showing that um, doses exceeding uh, 400 international units actually increase the risk, risk of dying by about 10% uh, over a, a several year period. And um, you might wonder why that is, but um, the reason is that these supplements are not uh, the same as food sources of vitamin E. So if you're just taking the alpha tocopherol, then your body has to compensate by drawing the other tocopherols and you know, complex uh, parts of vitamin E from your body. And uh, that large dose of one um, isolated ingredient is not what your body is used to getting, and that can cause harm. Same thing with uh, vitamin A. So. Um, we'll take the example of vitamin A, which you commonly hear of the term beta carotene, you know, from carrots and, and other things. And often when you look at supplements, you'll see vitamin A supplement could be just uh, beta carotene. But in fact, that's not the case. Um, vitamin A in foods has um, about five different uh, complexes, including uh, retinol, retinoic acid, carotenoids, um, and beta carotene, so there's many components to the vitamin A complex. It's actually a very complicated uh, group of compounds, not just one uh, item. And so studies have shown that beta carotene supplements actually cause more lung cancer among uh, smokers. So, um, so you might think that the, um, the important thing then is not to worry about antioxidants and that uh, antioxidant status doesn't matter, but that's not the case either because we know that from research that the more antioxidants you have in your body, the lower the risk of uh, heart disease, diabetes, all the diseases that um, kill us in modern society. But those antioxidants have to come from foods um, because supplements do not, are not really effective at raising um, that level in your body and protecting you. So my conclusion on supplements is that you do want to get most of your micronutrients uh, from food. And then um, I'm not up against supplements. I think um, testing to diagnose nutritional deficiencies is very important. Uh, you can work with your healthcare practitioner to do that and then select supplements to treat certain uh, measured deficiencies uh, can be really helpful and very important. And be especially careful um, with a few supplements. So. Iron, there's a pretty common um, problem with anemia where you could be deficient in iron, but uh, there is also the problem of um, iron overload or too much iron, which um, um, like with most nutrients, there's a kind of a narrow sweet spot where you, you, don't, uh, you need uh, just enough, but you don't want too much. And with iron uh, as well, there's some interesting research coming out about the role of iron in uh, diabetes and uh, problems with blood sugar. Um, and there's even some studies where they um, ha took patients who had diabetes and had them donate blood or give blood and reduce their iron and found that their blood sugar went down because iron levels were going down in their, their blood. So, um, so be very careful with iron. Um, calcium as well. Um, there's probably um, a lot of, um, you know, if you might have heard about the controversy about calcium supplements. So for many years, um, doctors recommended that people, especially women, take extra calcium to um, pre prevent osteoporosis. 
but um, that's more and more um, you know, uh, changing because research shows that uh, calcium supplements have um, risk of heart disease and uh, raising the risk of heart disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. And so it's, that doesn't apply to calcium from foods. So it's really best to try to get most of your calcium from foods. And um, if you're trying to prevent osteoporosis, you know, make sure you're getting enough vitamin D and uh, um, vitamin K2. So these are all nutrients that I talk a lot about in my book, but basically um, calcium supplements are not the way to uh, prevent osteoporosis. You want to really rely on foods for calcium. <clears throat> we talked about vitamins A and E and the, um, um, the studies where there's potential harm, so be very careful with taking those supplements. And lastly, um, vitamin D. Um, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here in, uh, have had their vitamin D level measured in the last one year? Okay, so a few people, okay. So um, vitamin D is one of the popular um, vitamins right now, and it's very important. But uh, like anything, it doesn't mean that um, you, you know, more is always better because you want to uh, have your level checked. Uh, a simple blood test that you can ask your doctor for will, um, will help with measuring that. And then treating to maintain uh, appropriate level is, is very beneficial, but you don't want to be taking it indefinitely or taking really high doses um, just like all the other uh, supplements. Okay, so now we're going to move on to part two of my talk. So we talked briefly about um, vitamins and minerals, and now we're going to talk about uh, the phytochemicals. So phytochemicals are basically all of the compounds in plants that protect us against disease. And right now, there's uh, almost 40,000 that are uh, being studied. They all have uh, very long and complex names, and uh, um, the wild ancestors of our modern fruits and vegetables were much um, higher in phytochemicals. So uh, what you see in the supermarket or farmer's market today is very different from what our ancestors um, were eating, you know, uh, some thousands of years ago. And basically, um, the trend has been to make fruits and vegetables larger, more productive, uh, sweeter, and uh, less bitter less fibrous, more attractive, and uh, through that whole process of plant breeding, a lot of these phytochemicals uh, have been lost. And so the, that's where the advice about just eating fruits and vegetables doesn't necessarily apply because you have to know what to eat, and that's what we're going to talk about in some detail uh, today. So uh, Americans, uh, we have the uncanny ability to choose the least nutritious options. And I'm not talking about fast food or McDonald's, I'm talking about fruits and vegetables. So um, every year uh, we eat 57 pounds uh, per person of iceberg lettuce. We also eat uh, 142 pounds um, per person of potatoes, uh, mostly in the form of french fries. And um, bananas and pears as well. So within each category, um, there, these are the most uh, nutrient-poor options. So, so let's get into some of the details. So we we'll start with iceberg lettuce. Oh, before we do that, I want to ask you guys a, a question. So um, to illustrate the difference between wild and modern foods, let's take the example of uh, apples. So this is a picture of some uh, wild apples. And uh, there was a study that looked at the um, nutrient difference between wild apples and your normal supermarket apples. So let's say you have uh, one ounce of wild apples in your right hand and one ounce of you know, your supermarket golden delicious apple in your left hand. Um, what would be the percent difference in um, nutrients, specifically the phytochemicals? So um, anyone want to throw out a number, the percent difference? 50 percent? No. Keep, keep, keep going. It's higher. We're going to keep going until we get 70? No, no. No, it's higher than, than 90. Keep going. 100? No, no. No, it's above 100%. 200? No, keep going. Okay. Keep going. Come on, I'm going to get the number. What was that? No, no, no. it's um, 300. No, it's more than that. More than 1,000. 5,000, more than 5,000. No, it's not infinite. <laughs> So do I hear 10,000 or no? Okay. So uh, 47,500. 
Yeah. So what that means exactly is that uh, if the um, there's a 475 um, times difference between the wild apples and modern apples. So wild apples have 475 times the number of antioxidants as our modern apples. So that's been you know scientifically proven, and uh, um, so it's really a huge difference. You know, it's not like we're talking about okay, 10% more, 20% more. Um, but if you can learn how to eat closer to the way that our wild ancestors ate, you can really get a lot more, you know, phytochemicals in your diet and really get that, those health benefits from all those uh, additional nutrients. So um, here are some general rules about how to maximize that, uh, the, that nutrient density. So the more deeply and intensely colored a fruit or vegetable, the more phytonutrients it has. So often these uh, darker colors like red or purple or blue reflect um, high levels of antioxidants like uh, red is typically um, anthocyanins, um, orange is typically carotenoids. So uh, the more deeply colored a plant, that's a sign that this plant has more uh, nutrients as well. Um, most of the plant's antioxidants are actually um, typically in the skin or just below the skin because antioxidants are the way that the um, plant defends itself. So this is part of the defense system of, the, um, of plants. So that's another clue, meaning that you um, always want to eat the skin whenever uh, possible. So if you can get more organic uh, produce and in general eat the skins, this is true of you know, potatoes, sweet potatoes, a lot of fruits like apples, pears, wherever you're eating the skin. In general, um, the skin and just below the surface is where most of the antioxidants are. Uh, same for avocados. You know, when you um, cut the avocado, you in a, right on, in underneath the skin, there's like a dark green kind of uh, layer. That's where the, most of the antioxidants are. So really scrape those skins uh, clean when you're eating those avocados. Okay, we're going to talk about lettuce because that's the, you know, most, one of the most common greens that people consume. So um, typical iceberg lettuce, um, which is the most popular uh, green in the country, you know, it's very, it's very crisp, refreshing, uh, kind of plain. Um, so, but it's really not much more than a fiber source. So it doesn't really have a lot of those phytochemicals or uh, phytonutrients. Um, so uh, does someone know what this kind of lettuce is? Romaine, yeah. So romaine lettuce is a much better option. Um, there's actually uh, significantly more antioxidants in uh, romaine lettuce. Uh, one tip that works with all kinds of lettuce is um, uh, something called lettuce wounding. So this was a term developed by researchers. Basically, with lettuce, uh, let's say you buy a head of lettuce and you take it home. Um, if you tear the lettuce up into uh, pieces and you know, put it in a bag, put it in the fridge. Basically, the, um, the next day, the lettuce will actually double in antioxidant value. And the way that works is um, because, remember, you know, plants are alive and antioxidants are how they defend themselves. So when you tear up the lettuce, it's a, a reflex that it's um, a response to attack, that the uh, lettuce produces a burst of phytochemicals and uh, um, you know, you can benefit from those the next day. All you have to do is tear up the lettuce into pieces and store it for 24 hours before eating. So that's a simple way to uh, increase the phytonutrient content with whatever kind of lettuce you are consuming. And then um, if you want to get more into the uh, really nutritious kinds of lettuce, so um, radicchio actually has about four times the um, antioxidants of the romaine lettuce, which was you know, still a good option, but radicchio is very nutritious. Um, there's a green loose leaf lettuce. So with the loose leaf lettuce, the red loose leaf lettuce is actually better than the green loose leaf lettuce because remember the rule, the brighter the color, the reds, it has more antioxidants. But green leaf, uh, loose leaf lettuce is still a good option in terms of um, antioxidants. And then arugula, which um, you know, has kind of a peppery taste, that's a reflection of um, the phytochemicals and protective compounds in arugula. So um, these are some ways to get more out of your leafy greens and uh, really get more antioxidants than um, you know, through iceberg lettuce. 
Okay, so now we're going to move on and talk about um, cabbage, which uh, um, actually is the world's number one vegetable. So uh, worldwide, um, I think there's something along the order of you know, 50 million tons of cabbage consumed every year. Um, and so red cabbage actually is um, about four times um, as nutritious as green cabbage. So uh, many more times the antioxidants, and if you can um, choose red cabbage, it's uh, um, far superior to the green cabbage. And um, um, you can even um, you know, find sauerkraut made from red cabbage, which is uh, a, a good uh, you know, fermented food. Okay, now cauliflower. So I took this picture at my local uh, farmer's market. Um, so there are some exceptions to the rule of um, that, uh, you know, the colors always has to be brightly colored. So even white cauliflower is, uh, is very nutritious. So just because cauliflower is white, it doesn't mean that it's lacking in antioxidants. Uh, white cauliflower is very high in a um, compound called glucosilinate, which is a strong cancer-fighting compound. So the cruciferous vegetables in general are uh, very strong cancer fighters. So, um, but the purple cauliflower is, um, does have about three times as many antioxidants as the white cauliflower. So um, if you're able to get uh, purple cauliflower, that's a good option. Um, have people seen the orange cauliflower around? Some of you have seen it? Yeah, so now they have, um, you know, there's a bright green cauliflower and orange cauliflower as well as purple. Those are all better options than the white cauliflower, but um, white cauliflower is still pretty nutritious in terms of uh, uh, phytochemicals. Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, sweet potatoes next. Okay, so we talked about um, regular potatoes, which are the number one vegetable in the United States, you know, almost uh, 150 pounds per person per year. Sweet potatoes, uh, Americans only consume about three pounds per person per year. Typically, Thanksgiving, you have the candied sweet potatoes, and then maybe you get a sweet potato pie in there a couple times uh, during the year. So um, I think sweet potatoes actually are um, underestimated and underused because they're um, actually lower glycemic than the regular potatoes, meaning that they have, um, even though they're sweeter and they're called sweet potatoes, they're actually better for your blood sugar. Um, they raise it more slowly than a regular potato. So, um, so it's lower glycemic and a sweet potato is much higher in antioxidants than a regular potato. Um, and um, the, uh, with sweet potatoes, the most nutritious kind is the purple sweet potato, which is uh, pictured here, uh, raw and then uh, cooked. But at your local market, you know, you'll find um, um, both um, orange-fleshed and white-fleshed uh, sweet potatoes. And in that case, the orange or yellow-fleshed sweet potato is more nutritious than the white-fleshed sweet potato because following that color rule that we, uh, that we talked about. Okay, now we're gonna um, talk a little bit about garlic. So uh, this is uh, one of the universal healers. So garlic alone has been found to have almost uh, 100 different phytochemicals. So um, the main one, the most active is called allicin. And uh, this is uh, an important tip about how to use garlic because garlic has so much antioxidant value and so much disease fighting power, but if you don't use it the right way, you don't get any of that benefit. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the main compound allicin is made in garlic. Um, so normally within each garlic cell, there's uh, two substances that have to be mixed together in order to make the, this key antioxidant. And that takes about 10 minutes for that process to occur. So basically, the garlic has to be either um, crushed or mashed. and this uh, enzymatic process starts and it takes 10 minutes for the active ingredient to be made. So if you just uh, crush garlic and throw it in, in the pan and cook with it right away, it's basically it, um, just a flavor. So you don't really get these um, antioxidants or um, active ingredients. So the way to uh, really get the benefits is to crush, mince, or mash the garlic and then um, wait for 10 minutes. So during that 10 minutes, the, after crushing, those um, two components in the garlic come together and create that uh, allicin, 
and then after 10 minutes, it becomes um, heat stable, meaning that you can then cook with it or um, you know, use it in, in your uh, recipes without damaging the uh, properties of it, still get the benefits. Um, so the key thing is you don't want to cook it immediately after crushing, you just want to wait 10 minutes and then um, you can either have it raw or cooked and you'll get the, the most health benefits out of the garlic. So that's a, a tip for getting the most nutrition out of the, the garlic. Okay, so now we're going to um, move on and talk about uh, onions. So um, here's a picture of a few different kinds of, uh, of onions. So um, does anybody have a guess about what is the most uh, nutrient-dense um, onion that's on this slide? If you would Red onion, yeah. Leeks, I heard leeks, okay. Scallion, who said scallion? You're right. So this is kind of a trick question because you might think that the red onion is the um, richest in antioxidants and it's far better than the white onions, which are not pictured. Um, the white onions or um, you know, so-called sweet onions, like the sweet onions that you see a lot in, in the summer and that you, you know, put on sandwiches, sweet onions are very low in antioxidants. Uh, it's really the more pungent, uh, spicy or sharp tasting onions that have the antioxidants. So red onions are a good option and leeks are actually also pretty high in antioxidants. But um, scallions are the clear winner, the green onions. And the reason why is that um, scallions are thought to be similar to how uh, wild onions used to be, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So they were, um, you know, very small, and the bulb was very small, and they were um, mostly the leaf. And, you know, over the years, onions have been bred for the largest bulb, so the bulbs have become, you know, really huge. And, uh, but this is um, basically unchanged from how, um, you know, wild onions used to be, uh, many years ago, and the, so the the difference is uh, um, again really really significant. So it's uh, fourteen thousand percent is the uh, difference in antioxidant value between um, scallions and uh, uh, your regular white onions. So um, it's a really good way to get more antioxidants into your, into your diet, just incorporating more of the green onions or uh, or scallions. Uh, in addition to leeks as well are a good option. Um, just try to steer clear of the sweet onions, uh, which are, and the white onions. Okay, next we're gonna be talking about uh, tomatoes. So um, there's a lot of different kinds of tomatoes on this slide. Uh, um, do people uh, wanna point out any uh, particular variety they recognize on this slide? Roma, yeah, I heard Roma. Cherry tomatoes, yep. Tomatillo. Tomatillo, yeah, there's a whole bunch over there. What was that? Green, yeah, these are the tomatillos. Uh, this is the, um, the beef steak tomato with the kind of ribbing that you see. Um, so with tomatoes, basically, the more uh, intensely red they are in, in general, the better, the higher the antioxidants. Um, these up here are the sun gold tomatoes, which are very pretty to look at, um, but they don't have much in terms of antioxidant uh, value. The, um, so the, one of the rules I talked about earlier was that smaller is better in terms of uh, being closer to wild ancestors. So that holds true with tomatoes. So the um, cherry tomatoes actually have um, about uh, three times the amount of lycopene as the larger tomatoes, the Roma or the, the beefsteak. And uh, um, even within cherry tomatoes, the smaller cherry tomatoes have more nutrients than the larger cherry tomatoes. So the rule applies even within the same category. So for example, um, this one, if you were at a farmer's market and choosing the cherry tomatoes, you know, I would suggest choosing the smaller one. This one is probably much more nutritious than the bigger one. And also the flavor. So the smaller ones have the most uh, intense flavor and um, you know, the higher um, antioxidant comp uh, level. So um, in this slide, so what is the, what would you guess would be the richest source of lycopene uh, in, the, in the slide here? Yeah, that's true. The purple ones are missing. That those are very high in antioxidants. 
Um, so within the slide, what do you guys think is the most, uh, you know, the richest source of lycopene? The cherry tomatoes, okay, no, not, th not those. Tomato sauce. Tomato sauce, yes. Really? <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, so, yeah, well, uh, so tomato, you know, technically is a fruit, but the reason why the tomato sauce is in there is because uh, uh, it goes back to the question about uh, cooked versus raw. So, you know, is it best to eat uh, a, f a vegetable raw? Is it best to cook it? And the answer is it depends, you know, it depends on the vegetable. So, for example, with broccoli, it's much better to have it raw because you get a lot more of the cancer-fighting compounds. With tomatoes, um, when you actually cook uh, tomatoes, um, you double the lycopene content. And the, the reason why is that um, tomatoes do have a, a fairly rigid cell wall, and by heating them, you're breaking down the cell wall, releasing more of the lycopene to be absorbed. And then um, cooking, uh, heating up tomatoes actually changes the, um, the shape and of the molecule, the lycopene molecule, into a form that you can absorb better. So for those two reasons, um, cooked uh, tomatoes and tomato sauce or tomato paste are actually by far the uh, richest uh, concentrated source of lycopene. So um, a typical serving of tomato sauce has about eight times a comparable amount of uh, a raw, um, uncooked uh, tomato. So, um, you definitely want to get the benefits of cooked tomatoes as well. Okay, so we're going to uh, shift gears now and um, talk a little bit about spices. And um, um, that's a big part of my uh, book, The Paleovedic Diet. And uh, uh, the reason why is that uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, spices are considered to be medicinal. They have um, you know, truly powerful healing properties. They're the most uh, nutrient-dense foods on the planet, second to organ meats. So there was a researcher from Harvard who um, sought to classify different categories of foods into nutrient density and see what was the most nutrient-dense. So number one was um, organ meats, but uh, you know that's often hard or not palatable for people to eat. But spices were actually second, so um, a much more accessible way to get a lot of the uh, nutrients. They're a great source of antioxidants, as I mentioned. Um, in general, spices are very effective at reducing inflammation. So um, inflammation or chronic inflammation is one of the root causes for most modern disease, like heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And um, a lot of spices, like um, you know, you've probably heard of turmeric and ginger and uh, cinnamon, um, all of these really help with inflammation. So. Um, they can help prevent some of the uh, most common diseases that are uh, prevalent right now in, in the United States. Um, spices are also a great way to support digestion and strengthen your digestion. So in Ayurvedic medicine, it's believed that all disease starts in the gut and starts with, from digestive health. So um, spices can be a way to keep a healthy digestion. And finally, they're actually very helpful in uh, maintaining a healthy blood sugar and uh, metabolism, and in some cases, uh, even with uh, weight loss. Um, and uh, um, so spices are very beneficial for that, um, that reason as well. Uh, plus, they make your food taste better, so it's kind of like, like a win-win. So um, I'm going to uh, leave a lot of time for, um, for questions, but I want to um, conclude by pointing out um, that uh, the most important thing is that healthy eating should be fun and uh, um, you know cooking and e sharing meals with family members is you know very very important um, here's some pictures of a uh, um, couple of fr fruits we didn't talk about but uh, with nectarines um, the uh, there's a red fleshed nectarine which is very rich in uh, phytochemicals and uh, Remember, with all nectarines, the skin is where the antioxidants are, more than 50%, uh, just like peaches and you know, all the other fruits we talked about. So be sure to eat the skin. Um, mangoes are actually um, not consumed very widely in the US, but um, very rich sources of vitamin C, actually five times more than oranges. Um, so mangoes are a very good source of vitamin C and also other um, phytochemicals. And finally, I want to mention um, with the 
um, papaya that uh, um, they're a very rich source of um, plant-based uh, compounds and also a uh, you know, great source of fiber. Um, this uh, red-colored uh, flesh is also very high in lycopene, so um, papayas and mangoes are a good, uh, good option in terms of um, um, nutrition as well. Um, so if you want to learn more about my work, um, um, you can connect with me on social media or my website, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions as well and, and meet with you afterwards. So thank you for your attention.